The Avatar universe is beautiful, but even in what is considered by many a masterpiece there are better and worse things. In this video we will look at all the books, and I mean seasons, of both series and order them from worst to best. This is Appa Comics. Before we start I think it's worth clarifying that both Korra and Aang, I don't feel that there are bad seasons. Overall they all have their thing, and if we were to take any of the books out we would miss out on some gems in the story, or things that had to happen. That being said, let's get started. The Legend of Korra Spirits, Korra's journey through the spirit world to experience the most important event in history, was not executed well enough to be the episode it should have been. The Legend of Korra Season 2 is at the bottom of this top, and the reason is that Nickelodeon killed it before it was born. Why? Korra had already ended in a pretty decent way and the main thing they wanted to show about the characters had been shown. The Legend of Korra started as a mini spin-off series from Avatar The Last Airbender, and the contract said it would be 12 episodes and that was it. With this in mind, a plot was created for the characters that would begin and end in those 12 episodes. At the end, it went very well. Mike and Brian decided to bring out more products from the franchise, this time with an animated movie in theaters, telling the story of how the Avatar team goes on a journey to find Ursa, the mother of Zuko and Azula. But, Nickelodeon decided against it. The movie was cancelled and a second season of 14 episodes was authorized for The Legend of Korra. Which meant changing everything, after a terrifying villain, who can use blood bending in the daytime and also take away powers, what could be done, so that the next villain would not feel insignificant? Of course, a dark avatar that transforms into a megazord. Enrolled in what? On the other hand the already closed love story between Korra Asami and Mako had to be reopened, making the audience feel that the avatar did not learn anything, showing a big regression, and going back to being a capricious girl. Now that the avatar ended the series controlling all the elements even managing the avatar state and learning the energy bending, how do we continue? Of course, by heavily nerfing the avatar state so that now it goes from being a super power up, to a nitro for racing on an air scooter. The poor planning of the Legend of Korra series destroyed the appreciation of the fans, since in the beginning all the meat was thrown on the grill in 13 episodes and being little time, many things were rushed that could have been told later only if Nick had planned it with more time. This would be like if an avatar the last airbender, Aang and Katara fell in love and kissed in book one. Don't you think it's a bit rushed? As for the season itself, it has some beautiful scenery and powerful fights. Plus the story of Avatar Wan, which I love. Because he is the first Avatar and also because as it happened in the episode The Avatar and the Fire Lord, it's always great to see a beginning story. But to be very honest, the first time I saw it, I didn't think it was so good. All this origin of the benders with the lion turtles and the spirits of light and darkness. Nowadays I love it and I totally accept it, but at the time I said, what? With respect to what we were shown I think it was a very important event, of a magnitude even greater than that of Sozin's Comet, but lost prominence on the one hand by this bad planning, on the other hand because at least for me, it feels somewhat boring the previous story with the civil war and so on, and although it is the season with more episodes of the Legend of Korra, it seems to me that the final fight between Analik and Korra could extend a little more because in the end everything is resolved in two episodes. Besides this, we have the disappearance of all Korra's past lives, which was a big pain to finish the series and see that this was never solved. Now the Avatar 1 is Korra and while hopefully later this can be solved but so far the canon of the story says that there is only one past life for the next Avatar. Anyway, it's not a bad season, it has its very good moments, some fights that look very good, but it's not enough if we compare it with other books. 
The sixth place of this top goes to Book 4 of The Legend of Korra, which needed to come out to tell us what happened to the Avatar after the poisoning by the Red Lotus. Well, in my opinion I think the ending of Season 3 was perfect and it would have been an epic ending for the series. So what Nickelodeon series ends with the most tragic and beautiful ending you can see? Absolutely none. I guess it was Nick who decided to show us Chorus recovery and put a new antagonist, as well as plant a big doubt in the fandom for a while, Asami and Korra. Because yes, they never kissed, but later in the comics they showed it openly. The controversial season 4 has some incredibly good things and some incredibly good things. Let's talk about it a little bit. For starters the fights with metal bending are a beast, even better than in season 3 where we had the main characters for a while in Zeofu. Toph's appearance and participation was something that had been missing in previous books and it was great. She feels exactly like her childhood version, something that was not so noticeable in her adult version seen in other books. Well, what about the time you guys took down the Fire Lord? That must have been epic! Oh, yeah. It was hot. I was on a blimp. And I think a giant turtle showed up. Wow, what a day. <laughs> I told him to say that! The episode Korra alone paying homage to Zuko alone, was a little gem with some pretty strong scenes and very well done. Seeing Korra destroyed is hard but excellently well done, because literally, you can see that she is very bad, hitting rock bottom and they transmit it very well. The adventures of Milo, Ginora and Iki, as well as what they experienced with Varric and Bolan was also very entertaining in this book, something that sometimes in other seasons didn't feel very interesting. The antagonist never fascinated me, but she is not the worst, and the reappearance of Zaheer was also something cool. Outside of Kuvira as a villain, the situation that arises, of someone who has a large army and in a diplomatic way, in many quotes, takes more and more ground, is very interesting. We have seen some examples of conquest in this universe but with Kuvira it all felt much more real. Or she basically said, Sign here and give me all your city or get ready for us to take it by force. All that would be the good thing from my point of view. The bad thing is that I found it tedious, some characters unbearable, the team quite divided, some things in CGI feel quite ugly, and well, the Megazord? You close a series that had incredible things and contributed a lot of lore to the world of Avatar, with a Megazord. Lastly and most controversial for 90% of Chorus haters is the Chorus Ami, that of her, yes, it's true, they showed us few signs so that in the last chapter they decide to leave without telling anyone on vacation to the spirit world. They should have shown a couple more close-ups, some blushes, something. But other than that, is it bad? Not at all. I think 90% of the people who complain about it being a lesbian relationship are being super hypocritical and if we saw their track record on certain pages we would confirm it. The problem is that at first glance, the relationship between the two was accelerated and seemed out of nowhere. They don't give us strong enough hints like they do with an egg in Katara or a Mako in Korra at the beginning. But serious question. Why? And why Nick obviously didn't want to be showing hints of homosexual relationships on a kid's channel at the time. I'm not sure if that's what they show on TV now, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if little by little there are cartoons that openly show homosexuality or characters without a defined gender. Of course this is not new, remember Shaman King? Remember Ryu and his wooden sword? The guy was gay. I didn't even remember it when I was a kid, and I used to see him having chocolate after school when I was 10 to 11 years old. Obviously it's an anime and it wasn't in Nick, but my point is that maybe the reason why it felt so forced is because Nick didn't want to show any kind of hint or insinuation. Times have changed quite a bit, and maybe if we saw the same thing today it would be hated but not as much. Anyway I think season 4 has its good things, but it falls short compared to the other books in this top. In the fifth place of this list we go with the first season of Avatar, The Last Airbender. 
The truth should be higher only out of respect. It was the beginning of a whole franchise in all this beautiful world. It was also the first tour of the four nations, without closing punctually in one place. I think it is not a bad season at all, as well as any in this top. They all have their good and bad things, but there are some that have more good things than others. I think the reason why it is the book I like the least is because it feels much more childish, having stories that do not fascinate me as the freedom fighters, or the great divide and having some things that to this day I do not like as the super fleeting relationship between Sokka and you or how Iroh suggests to the princess to return to the water without having heard the story of his birth, at least not on camera, I do not know, I always seemed weird to me. Other than that they have their great moments and to this day it still gives me goosebumps to see the scene of Aang merging with the spirit of the ocean. Well done thing. Of course it's not a bad season, and maybe it's the one that brings me more nostalgia because it's the one that most episodes were shown in Nick, but if I had to stay with one of the three seasons of Aang this would be the last one I would choose. We continue with the fourth place, and it is for book two of the first series. This season has a little less childish jokes but it does have something that makes it a little more tedious and that is that practically all happens in the Earth Kingdom, or it feels like half the book is in Ba Zing Se, and the other half in the desert, at least that's what happened to me. I think that although it has some plots a little dense as the drill, the library, or the desert, it compensates very well with the good things. To begin with, Toph joins the team and this adds 1000 points. We meet this super funny and powerful character who teaches the bald guy to use earth bending hard. We also see a gigantic evolution in Zuko, back and forth, starting as an enemy of the Fire Nation, and returning triumphantly to his nation after having eliminated the Avatar. In the middle, we see him touch bottom, face his sister, change to the side of good, make difficult decisions, and all this is a jewel that adds a lot to the story and makes him a much more lovable character, because yes, the first time I saw Avatar I had trouble loving this bald and screaming Zuko. It also expands something that I love about this world and are the sub-bendings, we know the metal bending, sand bending, and lighting bending as well as its deviation. The end of season is a jewel, everything happens very fast and the truth is that I did not live it at the time it was on TV as a super fan of Avatar but I imagine the intrigue that the public was left after the episode The Crossroads of Destiny. I say that I did not live it as a super fan because yes, I loved the series, I watched it every time I could, but someone from the old school, remember how hard it was as a kid to watch a series in a linear way? It was really hard. They put the series at a certain time, they changed it, when you were getting to the end, they went back to episode 1. It was hard to follow the thread. Besides, at that time the only thing you went on the internet for was to play the games on the Cartoon Network page but I didn't see YouTubers talking about Avatar, see theories in forums or things like that. Back to the series, the Guru episode is a jewel along with hard work both giving bending lessons to the protagonists but also giving life lessons to us the public. In short, the book is a jewel, even though sometimes it gets a little tedious, it has some chapters that compensate for 100 times this and make it a jewel. The third place of this top is occupied by season 1 of Korra, which was a beauty. On the one hand, it revived the nostalgia of the fans who had not seen anything since the end of the Aang series years ago. I mean, I remember the first time I found out that Korra existed. I was much older, I hadn't seen Nick for years and I wasn't even aware of it, so I watched it on Quivana. On the other hand, it brought us a graphic quality stupidly superior to what we saw in Aang. The technology had advanced and the colors, the fights, the backgrounds and the format was incredibly superior. We were shown some characters from the past and others who were descendants of them, such as Tenzin, which at first I thought it was Aang as an adult before Korra was born until I saw the two together. The character designs were crazy and that 40s or 60s style of clothing combined with the Four Elements theme was also genius. I know that many are fascinated by it, but probending was also implemented and we saw a lot more masters using sub-bendings like metal or electricity. 
Of course it also got thousands of criticisms for its abrupt advance in technology, the lack of empathy with the new avatar and his teenage romances. Other things that are not so good is to see all the story happen in a single city, the new avatar team is not the most lovable in the world and the change of time feels very strong, that is, despite being a continuation, it is very different from Avatar, The Last Airbender. But apart from this, even those who hate Korra there is no way to deny that the animation was an incredible advance in this new series, the fights look much more fluid and its new elongated format gives it a much more vivid and immersive environment. The backgrounds in the scenes are literally paintings and look too good. The antagonist is a beast and that they involve bloodbending was something that at the time was a 100 as we had been left wanting in Avatar, the last airbender to see a bit more. Season 1 of Korra was something very well done overall and unlike Season 2 which is at the bottom of this top, the airbook has been much better accepted. Let go your earthly tether. Enter the void. Empty and become wind. Empty and become wind. In my personal opinion the peak of the Legend of Korra was reached in Season 3. I have a video on the channel commenting on why I think it is the best of the Legend of Korra but in general terms we have a very powerful group of antagonists who are not almost gods or have abilities too broken as remove powers. Yes it is true that virtually all have abilities out of the ordinary, but nothing crazy like the aforementioned. The ideals of the antagonists and how they execute them without fear of consequences is great. They show us the coldness they can have to achieve their goals and along the way they show us some of the most epic fights of the whole series. To this is added the return of the airbenders with a lot of lore about them, some incredibly good landscapes and something that we saw little or nothing before and that is, how an air nomad is educated and trained. Chorus maturity is noticeable, the Avatar team, at least for a while, is together and the travels through the Earth Kingdom and Republic City are back. The bad thing about this season in my opinion is its short duration. I think for having 13 episodes as it had, it felt all 10 points, nothing felt rushed and everything agreed as it should, but if the end I think it was something rushed with a defeat to Zaheer something meh for my taste. What is a total gem is the final ending of this season, with a Jinora receiving her tattoos in a very touching and beautiful ceremony but with a Korra in a wheelchair totally destroyed by the poison that the Red Lotus administered to her. As I commented previously I think it would have been a great ending for the series, to leave us with the intrigue of what happened to Korra. It would break with all the schemes of endings of a series, it would leave us with a pretty big emptiness and a bellyache of why this was so. But well that didn't happen. Despite this, Book 3 is one that any fan of Avatar The Last Airbender should see because it is a beauty and its villains are far above any we have seen in the Bald Man series. Finally we come to the post one that as it could not be otherwise, four tastes of this bison the best season of the entire series of Avatar is the book 3 of Avatar The Last Airbender. The book fire shows us an Aang who died in his back, after a coma after his confrontation with Azula. Waking up with hair and on a ship of the Fire Nation. In this season the jokes are still there but they don't feel super childish as previously. They show us how for almost the entire book the team is in Fire Nation territory, and it's genius. I don't know if I was the only one, but as a kid, watching Avatar and hearing Fire Nation is like don't go there. Now to see that they were in the Fire Nation, in that super dangerous place, disguising themselves to go unnoticed was cool. From their new costumes which I think are some of the best in the whole series, to every chapter, even the filler stuff in this season are excellent. There is not one that I think over my head and say, nope, I better skip it. In addition to this we have new sub bending like combustion and blood bending, Sozin's comet about to happen and perhaps the most powerful of all, Zuko redeeming himself and joining Team Avatar. This book is what closes and turns Avatar The Last Airbender into a masterpiece because it takes elements that were subtly added in the previous books, and concludes each one here. 
Without this book Avatar would be a very good series, yes, but it would not be the almost perfect work that it is. Some of the most epic moments I've experienced watching a series are the fight between Aang and Ozai or between Zuko Katara and Azula. I laughed until I cried with the Nightmares episode and I always found the Ember Island episode very entertaining. I've never seen so much episode together as with Zuko joining the team and I think in literally no other series I've seen the ending and I say, what perfection, giving me that feeling of sadness, satisfaction, nostalgia, happiness, I don't know a mixture of everything. I've seen this ending more than 25 times and it still seems perfect to me. People, what do you think? How would you rank the books of both series from worst to best? Let me know in the comments. Of course in the future when we have the new Avatar Earth we will update this video, but for the moment that's all from me I send you a big hug and we will be seeing each other tomorrow with more videos. Bye bye. Oh.